Upper Echelon is brought to you by Deloitte. For innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning, turn to Deloitte. Bernard Swanepoel, entrepreneur in the mining sector, joins us now. I say that, Bernard, because looking at your background and your academic qualifications, you might easily have also gone into the financial field, a miner who understands the language of business. Did you ever think of becoming an accountant rather than a miner? I think there were more bursaries available for mining engineering when I left school. Um, And so that was an obvious choice. Grew up in Rustemirk, which is a mining town, and could have easy access to a bursary. And that's really how I became a mining engineer. But it was so early on, it was very clear that I better understand finances. Otherwise, I would have to call, uh, you know, financial guys, Manier and Sir and Your Highness. So that was the easy way out. So the BCom, when did you uh, study for that? Now, that was after my uh, mining engineering degree. So I did it uh, part-time at the time, mostly part-time. And then I did uh, honours in financial management to uh, make it a worthwhile qualification. You started as a learner miner. So that's really at the bottom. Yeah, that's part of the training. I had to do the so-called blasting ticket, blasting certificate, onset certificate. And I must say, as you get older, you realize the value of those sort of uh, early jobs, you know. It really gives you the perspective. Um, And it was actually quite fun, except for night shift. Did you do much of that uh, at Beatrix when you were working there to, at the age of 33, for those who don't know your history as well as those of us who research it do, uh, you became the general manager at Beatrix and then transformed the mine into the lowest cost producer in the country. Was it, um, was it a lot of hands-on infor- um, working? You know, obviously by then you sit at the top of the sort of uh, pile and uh, 3,000 or 4,000 people do the work and, you know, because you get to tell the story, you get the credit sometimes. But I was also there at a, at a special time, you know, I took over from some really great people. Gary Moore designed the mine, Sam Goodwin actually ran it very successfully. And when I got there, Neil Frenemann and Ferdy Dippenar and guys like that were all youngsters, you know, wanting to make our names. Uh, and so it was just a very special time, a set of coincidences that brought us all together there. But it was a very good time for me. What did you do different? You know, I uh, early on thought that uh, an industry that is like 100 years old has got some sort of uh, some sort of design inefficiencies in it, the way we think about our industry. Now, obviously, our industry in South Africa is a very labor-intensive industry, and so a lot of our labor practices are extremely outdated, the way we approach our people, the way we treat our people. You know, the sort of one man, uh, one day, one job sort of approach, you know, the approach of check your brain in at the the gate and then, you know, just bring your hands. Um, And those were the early days of the unions um, becoming extremely active, and, I mean, they co-partnered with us to change a few things, um, reduce the cost of production, and in the end, you can't control the revenue uh, or the price. You can only control the cost, and that's always been what we've been focusing on. Beatrix was, uh, I suppose, set you up very well for your next challenge, which was uh, Harmony Gold. You took over there. It was a small company, one and a half billion rand market cap. Twelve years later, when you left, it was, well, at some point, 34 billion rand market cap. That, I suppose, needed uh, a little bit of assistance from your BCom degree as well. <laughs> yeah, and again, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, the initially the workforce shrunk from 17,000 to, uh, I think, about 12, back to 45,000. And again, it truly is, you know, thousands of people who pull it all together. Um, but, you know, you do end up running a business, and gold mining was just the way we generated our revenue. But, I mean, it, it, you have to run it like a businessman. You were the fifth biggest gold mine in the world, from nowhere to number five. That takes some doing. What was on your was it on your radar right from the beginning to to be big? No, um, I always uh, thought big comes with its own problems. I still don't necessarily think big corporates is the sort of solution to the world's problems. Um, and in the end, uh, very much the the challenges of being big, you know, caught up in my opinion with myself and harmony to a large extent. Uh, but, you know, we were prepared to take assets that no longer fitted into the um, hands of the previous owners and sweat them, you know, run them differently. And it was just a biased market. I mean, you know, uh, all the other mining companies were consolidating, selling their South African assets. And there were times when we would really be the only buyers. So it was just a, a time where things came together, the rand weakened and therefore, you know, made us profitable, sometimes despite ourselves. And we could just do lovely deals, I thought, at the time. You mentioned 
just a moment ago that being big brought issues for yourself. When you left Harmony, uh, it was under, well, initially at least, a little bit of a cloud. You weren't allowed to talk about it. I remember we spoke later, some weeks later, when you were finally allowed to talk. And you said that uh, it, it displeased you that you weren't able to be more transparent at that point in time. But perhaps uh, you could elaborate a little on what were those issues for yourself of running a big company? Well, I would like to think I am a sort of an entrepreneur. I would like to think I like to start things and initiate things. Um, and quite frankly, as the company gets bigger, you end up, you know, just running meetings, running people, you know, uh, spending time in uh, shareholders' discussions. I mean, all the stuff that consumes the very busy people in uh, very big organizations. Um, and I also overstayed my welcome in the sense that I was there, I think, for some 12 years. Um, so my specific and unique contribution, if there was such a thing, was clearly no longer so unique. Um, the company grew, and I'm very proud of what was done there, um, and we set up great systems. But at the same time, on my watch, we, uh, not me, but I mean, the company I ran, um, you know, misimplemented a, a, a change over in a computer system, and it resulted in us bringing out results, which as soon as we brought it out, we had to say, oops, you know, these results are not, uh, you know, accurate. And quite honestly, the reason we get the big bucks at the top is because we should take accountability. And for me, it was on the one hand time to move on. And on the other hand, I had to accept some level of accountability for mistakes like that. Although I didn't make them, it happened on my watch. Interesting point you made there about your entrepreneurial instincts. Did that drive the attempted takeover of Goldfields? Yeah, um, I think even today I look back and uh, I think uh, if you look at the mining industry, I think that would have been a significant uh, step forward, uh, that consolidation step. I still think we sit with, uh, you know, uh, uh, South African operations in more and more uh, international companies that no longer really makes that sort of much sense. Um, one could argue that, you know, Harmony and Goldfields together could have been a real world-class player. Um, obviously, Goldfields didn't share our views at the time. They probably still don't share those sort of views. Um, but I, I really, at the time, was uh, strongly of the opinion that uh, it would be, you know, one plus two, as it was, uh, would be a lot more than three. Um, but we'll never know. I mean, you know, that's not all theory. But you're still having a lot of fun. Now, just interesting, a, a point before we go on to your uh, village operation at the moment. When you left in 2007, left Harmony, you told us, at MoneyWeb that you were keen on helping black mining entrepreneurs who managed to secure mineral rights. I haven't seen much of that. You've been busy in the DRC and you've been doing uh, some of your own stuff, but was there no appetite from those entrepreneurs to work with you? We actually, uh, in my consultancy to the point, were quite busy with that, uh, certainly up to the point when the sort of market uh, obviously got corrected quite significantly. Um, funding for those uh, assets are extremely problematic. We uh, we did some lovely transactions in uh, manganese uh, space, uh, coal mining, uh, for example. Uh, so there uh, certainly were some opportunities, um, but quite honestly, without funding, and I could never bring the funding. You know, I could bring a few grey hair to the to the party, but. Uh, I think the banking uh, funding model for these types of projects have all but uh, dried up, uh, Alec. The things to be assessed still in uh, South African context. Uh, I know that uh, there are many in the mining industry who think yet another shake-up needs to be done. You, you're doing partly that at Village. You went in, bought uh, a cash shell or bought a, a big chunk of a cash shell in 2008 and uh, put a few assets in there, very attractive ones, and, of course, more recently did a transaction with Simmers. It looks like you, or to outsiders anyway, you're doing another harmony. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we certainly are to some extent uh, playing to our strengths, I would like to think. Um, this is uh, much smaller and therefore certainly a faster moving, more entrepreneurial uh, environment. Um, we are to some extent buying assets which no longer fit into the portfolios of some of the larger players. I mean, Consmerts, our little antimony mine, we bought out of Metarex, and the rest is history. I mean, Metarex is moving on and being taken over now. Um, and then the uh, Simmers assets, which are basically two gold mines, 
and some shares in, a, in another company are all assets which we believe are in desperate uh, need for tender loving care. Uh, Buffles, uh, the old gold mine especially, we're busy restructuring it and hope to return it to profitability. And if we can do that successfully with the help of uh, all, all the other stakeholders, then we'll create a lot of value. Bernard, are there major issues in the South African mining industry that need to be addressed for it to fulfill the potential? We hear so much of this $2.5 trillion that's under the ground in value, but we don't see too much investment in exploiting it. You know, I think uh, on some of the boards I said, I obviously see the, the issues around uh, logistics, you know, ability to get the product to the market, export and so on. In gold mining, that's not really a factor. But in gold mining, we certainly are dramatically impacted on by uh, um, the issues of uh, labor productivity. You know, I mean, you know, we all would love to um, pay more per worker, but then obviously in return we need to find a way of getting uh, you know more out of our people, all our assets, including the people uh, you know. So pe uh, labor productivity, the fact that we still keep. Uh, keep on killing people in our minds can't be acceptable and right now it's costing a fortune if you have an accident or an injury it will cost you money and it's so it should and then uh, I also think uh, the the crazy conversations where we're the one country in the world who want to reopen the debate on nationalization I mean you know it's it's a legitimate debate here in our little southern tip of Africa, but for the rest of the world, they don't need to go through this again. I mean, they can take their money to places where this is no longer a topic for discussion. On the Money Web Wikipedia, uh, you were asked what advice you would give to a young person, and you said, pursue your happiness, be brave in it, the money will follow. You happy that uh, that that still applies to you today? Having yeah. just turned fifty, I should credit my wife. Uh, she's always lived that. Uh, you know, she said, "Do what you you know what you love doing. Do it, do it with people you like working with, and you know if you you'll then be good at it and you'll make money out of it." Uh, and I, I really think that is true. I think uh, you know we make far too much about there's only one job, and you know we all need to pursue the highest paying job. And quite honestly, as you get to 50 and older, I think you realize happiness is really what life should be about. So what's the next five-year plan, as it were, in your life? Not that I think you work towards these things, but are you looking to take Simmers to be the number five gold miner in the world one day? Well, uh, in Valitz, we will be uh, testing um, this uh, model of taking assets, which we think can be run differently, uh, and uh, repackage them involve uh, the communities and the workers differently to what is currently being done, um, but certainly not build another big mining company. So my plan, if we could be very successful, would be to regularly surprise our shareholders with dividends, either in cash or in specie, um, as opposed to getting bigger. So we want to create value, but then return it to shareholders uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, not just get bigger and bigger and uh, become a mining house. Bernard Swanepoel, mining entrepreneur and the man who's driving Village after its recent acquisition of Simmers into the future. And Upper Echelon was brought to you by Deloitte. For innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning, turn to Deloitte.